A um, little show of hands, little show of hands, we're not going to get you dancing and things like that, but a little show of hands. Who thinks it's a white elephant? Oh, okay, so, if it's not a white elephant, it's one in the corner, right, speak. Who thinks it's a silver, silver bullet? <laughs> it, it's... <laughs> More, yeah, more, yeah, more. Yeah. 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 I've got a big fence that everybody's sitting on. So, what is a white elephant? Well, to possess it is useless or troublesome, especially one that is expensive to maintain or difficult to dispose of. And that's the English dictionary, by the way. However, silver bullet also could be a simple and seemingly magical solution to a complicated problem. So that's what we're here to discuss today. Uh, through through the time that we spent over many years in box automotives at Ellsmere Port. So we thought, how do we tell this? Do we tell it as, as you've done yesterday, people? Two things, and I spoke to Wilhelm before, leadership, culture, for me, that, they are the key. So we thought, could we do it as a story? Could we talk about transformation of a British automotive company? By the way, it's not Nissan, it's not Honda, it's not Toyota. But we're going to do it through the eyes of two apprentices. Because we were apprentices one day, I know we don't look very old, but many, many years ago, we <laughs> were apprentices. Used to look like uh, this. If you look, oh. here's Roddy, when he was young, <laughs> as he's out here, now 23 then. Now please, the picture of me. <laughs> now, that is me with her. That is me with a moustache. And I was one of the first um, CMM apprentices that Vauxhall had for something like 10 years. <laughs> People see us today as, a bit like this, <laughs> uh, because we think in any, oh, it's gone blank. anything in life, if you can't yeah. enjoy it, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah? yeah. So, Roddy, by the way, what we've done is put our names on the slide, so, so we're going to take so his slide. Yeah? Go on. Okay, so to start off with uh, this transformation, uh, the company started back in 1857 as a pumper marine engine uh, manufacturer. Uh, started manufacturing cars in 1903 at the Vauxhall Ironworks, which is somewhere in London. Somebody referred to it to me that they were quite close to that. Uh, it was purchased by General Motors in 1925, just before we joined. And, uh, and it was consolidated as part of uh, uh, Opel Europe. Uh, so we, we amalgamated and became Vauxhall Opel, owned by General Motors in, in the States, obviously. Um, and then, towards the end of our careers, right at the end, in the last few months of my career, uh, PSA, Peugeot Citron, uh, bought us out. So I had four months under their, their tutelage at that time. So that was a bit of a, a, bit of a shock, to say the least. Uh, so. so what we're going to do is take it through the decades. Yeah, we're going to give you a little snapshot of each of the decades, because it, it was a 40-year change. So in the 70s, the culture was non-existent. Anybody work with trade unions? Okay, so you all know what trade unions are like. Um, management were not interested. There was no such thing as schedules, anything like that. You just made what you got. It was poor work practices. Conflict was consistent. Paying conditions. Now, it's quite interesting when you compare paying conditions to today because the labor disputes were, in that year, that was 1979, the company were off on a 17% pay rise. Okay? That guy there with the big used days. to work with the <laughs> labourer. That trade union wants 25%. Okay? And we were young apprentices, wondering what we joined. It was a toxic industry. We went into work because we weren't allowed to go on strike because we were apprentices. And we sat in an office, not allowed to work for 11 weeks. You weren't allowed to do anything, all the coffee machines slowly ran out through the factory, that's the only thing we're allowed to do. So you go in and sleep, seriously. You go and get come to get your sleeping bag, spend the day in work and go back. And in 11 weeks, and the management at the end of that said they would manage, so they come with a few sticks. I, just to add to that, I was, I'm a little bit older than, than John, so right. I, I come out of my apprenticeship, <laughs> one week out of my apprenticeship, and because I was fully you know, an electrician as I was, I had to go on strike for 11 weeks, didn't choose to. But you just went out with the with the masses kind of thing, so that I know that was a torturous time. But my dad worked at Vauxhall as well, so we had no money basically for eleven weeks. So I remember those times, you know, the ingrained burned into my brain, and they weren't they weren't good times. So you know, part of setting the scene of what it was like in the seventies, 
it wasn't a good place, you know, to, to be at all. This is my slide. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, John. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one in. If you look what we got, if you look at, actually the 50s were worse, but if you look in the 70s, you know, the, the, the discontent and everything, the strikes were left, right and centre. And it wasn't just Vauxhall. Um, and these strikes weren't because of pay conditions. These were things is demarcation. Three trade unions we have, not one, three. One for the electricians, one for the mechanics, and one for the production. And if an electrician, when they unscrew the bolt, they would walk out. But that's not the electricians. They would walk out and you would end up with a strike. So the demarcation was, you know, it was limited. Maintenance, probably, was on the electricians. Maintenance, if they're going to change a bulb, it'd take three of them to go along and decide how they were going to do it. It was massive. The size of the maintenance part was huge. But the downtime is crazy. So what we've done on each decade, where do we think it was? You know, where do we think it lies between? Where would you think it lies in that time? Oh. We actually down here, in fact, we'd have liked the white elephant at that time. We didn't have anything. We didn't have anything. There was no consistency. Well, the next slide, we're going into the 80s now. And this was a time of great investment. General Motors decided to invest heavily in automation and robot production lines. Yeah, it's on there. That's fine. Oh, no. Is it broadcasting to the police on their own chat? I just went to the toilet. <laughs> 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 okay, I'll talk through the area now, yeah. 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 So, in the early 80s, it was all about automation. And bear in mind, everything was manual uh, in the old days. It was manual welding guns. Uh, it went to robot automation. None of us had any training. Uh, and because of the hierarchy of trade unions, all the old guys got trained first, went on all the training courses, the young guys had to learn it on the hoop. So I had to learn about Modicon PLCs, how to program robots, all that kind of stuff, and keep production lines going. Uh, and it was still massively uh, demarcated, the plant. Okay. Yeah. Do that, yeah. Uh, so it's massively demarcated, so it's a terrible time. It was a great time, it was exciting, um, because we had all this automated production coming in. And that was one of the lines I worked on in the early 80s, that was the framing line. Uh, and that lasted well into the 90s, it was retooled many times. And I eventually became the, the maintenance supervisor on that, on that production line. Uh, and that's sort of one of the, the lines at the end of the body shop, towards the end of my time uh, there. Uh, so, one of the things that happened then was a reduction in headcount in the 80s because of the automation. So obviously you've got lots of union strife, lots of arguments. Not many strikes, but plenty of disputes, plenty of issues still. Uh, always, always, all the time. We used to have a thing called Sch Schindler Digiton, little robo trucks that took the, the dash panels around, and there used to be a demarcation over it was the spark, the electricians, or the fittest job to look after everything. So there was constantly battles, and all this time you're trying to improve and bring new technology. Yeah, great, so we had the first taste of the productivity gains, so there was a lot of redundancies in the 80s as well. People were paid up, but there was no proportion of redundancies ever at our plant, ever that we ever did. All the gains we made were all to the In terms of headcount reduction, were always managed by, by attrition and by people leaving the plant voluntarily. But the culture remained the same. We still had this, this fight all the time between whose job it was to do everything. Um, and it was never ending. So lean was not recognised, there was no lean, we didn't have any of that. So we had all this new technology, we all had to learn it, um, but nobody ever taught us how to behave with each other. Uh, so there was a huge gap in knowledge, clearly there had to be, we had to close up quickly to make the best of the automation. But there was just no investment in people. So where are we on the journey? Still, 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 uh, still, <laughs> still. So they spent billions and billions of dollars at GM on, on all the plants, on automation, all around the world, billions and billions, but never even looked or to look at how did the people interact with each other, how can we get the best of all this new technology. Yeah. 
So we moved into the 90s, so we're moving on. Uh, Robbie was quite old by that age. Um, so moving into the 90s, knew me. everybody knows the Numi story, because they probably don't know at the level that we know. Um, that was it. GM, we're going to work with Toyota. It's going to be the best thing since sliced bread. But all the European plants sent their top-level executives, people that were going to make it, you know, these high-potential people, to spend two years at Numi. But the problem was they were going to bring the processes back, but the culture hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. So they've gone, they've done all these things. When I know a guy called Phil Merwood, he, he was there for two and a half years. When they come back, they created new departments in all the European plants called QNIP, Quality Network Process Systems. They again made dedicated teams because you, there was that much waste in the factory, a blind man could have seen. Yeah, there was that much waste you didn't need to do. But these dedicated teams worked on waste reduction. They became job robbers, as everybody knows. But as Roddy said, we never, there was never a forced redundancy in Vauxhall from 13,000 when we started to the 900 people today. That gives you an idea of where it came from. But, you know, Typical line balancing, they'd learned this from Newby, come back, Newby Walls, it was papered everywhere, absolutely everywhere. But this team was a dedicated team, so they did involve production, the production supervision wasn't involved, so they just took away the low hanging fruit, but they applauded to the got was fantastic, you know, what a marvelous job they're doing. The difference is then, each of the business units, and I'm talking press shop, paint shop, body shop, general assembly, and quality. There was no coordination between the shops. They all worked differently. So General Assembly was doing all this wonderful work to try and take it down. But well, Body Shop, where Robbie worked, yeah, it's yours now, Robbie. Yes, yes, I'm just getting there. Yeah. I'm so enraptured by this to tears <laughs> Thanks, so, In the Body Shop, I spent the vast majority of my career, but in various roles, moving up through the ranks. Uh, we saw the introduction of TPM, but just as a standalone entity as a tool that they took out the box. Um, then we started doing CIPs, uh, and you might notice me there, the bit less there, that's not, there we are there. So that was in 1990, 1991, it was the first CIP that ever happened in, in the body shop, and that was a team of, of uh, electricians and fitters, and production operators, and production team leaders, and it was a very successful CIP. Uh, and one of the guys who was on, who's not on that picture, a guy called Peter Lynch was the, the shop steward who had to go on, you know, we always had to have a shop steward on one, but he should anyway, because they're, they're a stakeholder in it. He actually became my boss, he, he, was, he came to me and said, this is absolutely brilliant, the CIP, all this stuff, he said, uh, I'm going to get into this. So he, he, he changed, took his trade union hat off and became supervisor alongside me, quickly went through the ranks and became shift manager in about three or four years. So he used all his shop steward skills to better himself in the management arena and was very very successful and he was a really good boss because he bought into this stuff, hook, line and sinker. Um, another thing they started to introduce in the 1990s, DBI was designed Dimension International, it was an American training company because GM started to invest heavily in training in the early 90s. So that I was a, I was trained to be a trainer. So it was a week long course, intensive from seven till eleven at night, and you had to pass and all that kind of stuff. It was really intensive, but it was very Americanized. So if I was, and there were four hour sessions. If I had delivered it, no 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 uh, uh, any American <laughs> apologies, but the way it was it was Americanized. If you like, you know, okay, guys, we're all in this together, but, but don't forget we weren't in them days. You know, we, we were like that still. So. I had to pitch the training at a level that people could understand. So when you start your training session, the first thing you do is let the guys get the let steam off, you know, just tell them how rubbish the company is and all that kind of stuff. So storming, storming and forming, all that kind of thing. So I used to deliver them DBI training sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening. Three, four hour sessions, because maintenance were on three shifts. I'm telling you, I was tired by the end of 12 hours. So I used to get guys like a shop steward to come in with his dark safety glasses on, his overalls unbuttoned to the waist, no, no shirts on, apologies ladies. And he would take his shoes and socks off, sit there, <laughs> and he'd get his newspaper out of the pocket. And he was challenging me, you know, that's, that's what life was like in there, it was a challenge. I wanted to take him out the back and give him a good <laughs> hiding, as we would say. Um, but, you know, when everybody's looking at him, all the other people on the thing are waiting to see what I'll do. 
you know, so that was a test of my character and a test of my attitude. One which I passed with flying colours. Um, so it was the start of investment in people as well as in, in the process. Uh, and again, there was further improvements in productivity because the automation just kept coming over the years. I mean, so much so that by the 2000s, in the body shop, there were 839 robots in the body shop uh, when I left it to move on to something else. And only 100 people, whereas in the old days, there were 700 people on each shift. That was just production people, not, not all the maintenance people. So, where are we on the needle now? White elephants or silver bullet? About there. We started to move the needle. At last, we were starting to catch up. Um, but still a long journey, because we're only talking about sort of early, very early to mid 90s there. John? So, we got into the 2000s and things were starting to change. We were seeing changes. Lots more lean principles, you know, we were getting them coming out of our ears, to be honest with you. Did we know how to use them? Probably not. Um, introduced BPD. Now, BPD, you know, they, you know it's hosting can right today, but the way BPD ran was, this is how they cascaded, this is how GM wanted to happen. They would write the BPD for the world in November. That would be cascaded to the plant in December. From December, we would get it down to the units. From the units, it would go down to the supervision, and at the end, we would go all the way down to the team leaders. So we had lots of paper. Um, PPD for me worked, you know. Um, each unit got its own Kaizen team. Fantastic, we're going to make the changes now. You know, so body paint, they have their own Kaizen team. Standardized work, key pillar. I mean, if, if you actually want, job elements were a waste of time. People didn't follow, people didn't follow standardized work. They built the car. If you ever bought the car at about 2000 and you still got it, that's the luck. Just one um, thing. <laughs> yeah, the thing with standardized work, when it first started, it was all, all pencil and paper. Yeah. It was all hand drawn. And then we started to, and that was in the 90s, and then we started to move in the 2000s to automated systems. So when you're doing your line balancing, obviously it's easier to move the elements to work around. Because in the old days, you had a sheet of paper 10 foot long on a production line with all the value added, non value added, the little, you know, and it literally it was little magnets and things that you moved around to do your line balancing. Going right through the normal 5S, you think, well, it's 2000, put 5S, and we put it in a number of times. You, you, how many companies do you go into? It's a beautiful 5S port, but all the you know, the brushes, the spades, and whatever goes with it aren't there because they're missing. Um, <laughs> We got into a good laid audit process. One thing we did all the way from the plant director down, you know, typical laid audit, looking at safety, looking at visual management, looking at standard work. So something we used, and that was a good tool. And they, but, they've, got, they've got our logos on, because we use them still, because we managed to yeah. apply quite all the stuff when, yeah. when we left. But, but we were still failing miserably, absolutely miserably, due to poor management. So what you get when you're a car company of that size, you get help. Well, they called it help. So they brought in the turnaround team. So these are all ex-plant directors that have only got one thing, is to try and make it a success. But the problem that happens is, they took, I then I was an exec, they took us all to a hotel, and they give us this book. Has anybody read that book? High Velocity Cultural Change. So we're given this book, and we're all reading it. Well, it's not too bad. And the guy at the top just looked at us all and said, go to this chapter. <coughs> expect casualties and if you read it it says if you don't get rid of some of the people it's by pure luck so now as execs some of us have targets on your back and i was one of them because it wasn't a yes man as you can imagine um so his job was because of this book i think it was about 28 execs he needed to get rid of three to make it look like he's done his job and he did it for a period so moving on from john's uh battle with and the other guy was called John Paul. Don't know. mention his name. Like him. Yeah. People might know him. Yeah. So, so keeping on was through the 2000s, because we put 20 years together here, obviously. Um, there was a European drive to produce headcount, and the way that used to work was the targets would be set by Central Europe, and they used to play every plant against each other, regardless of the size, the complexity, what you made. Some made engines, some made cars, all that kind of stuff. So it was very raw, basic, uh, and it was all to do with your how many you required to run, your, your uh, cost per car, all, all those sort of basic metrics, of, uh, your BPD metrics. 
Um, so we'd have a five, ten percent headcount reduction year on year, regardless of what you were doing. You just had to take five or ten percent. Yeah, I think what that did, Robbie, sorry to jump in. What that did, it drove the plant. Everybody heard the term white rabbits. Uh, when you make sure you've got spare heads that you're not using, so you can make the target, it's not really there. Because if you make the 5 to 10 percent reduction, they come and hit you every 115. If you made 15, they come and hit you at 20. It was crazy, absolutely crazy. So if you come again, so the year before, you'd keep something in the you know, keep something in the pocket, knowing what the are going to come out the following year. So, so because of that, if you think about what the purpose of lean is, about mindset behaviours and taking the people with you, they didn't come with us. Every CIP was a battle. It was it was a behind the scenes agreements over what the outcome would be. So if you did a week long CIP with stakeholders, you do all your data gathering and you know how many heads you could get out, and you bring the senior stewards in the week before and say, "This is how many heads we're taking out," and they say, "Okay, uh, can you do it with? Can you give me two back?" And I say, "Okay." So at the last day we'll make a concession and give you two heads back. So he doesn't look like he's lost to his trade union members. That was how CIP worked in them days, unfortunately. So the lead, lead was used in our, in our industry through the whole of our life, more to reduce cost in everything. It was cost driven because we, had, we were in a game to survive always, but we were pitted against the other plants all the time. So we weren't allowed to grow as people, as individuals, as teams in the same way as we would really see, we really hope lean to do. And I think the important thing on the CIP, we made the mistake of saying if you can get a head out a team, we give them 12,000 pounds. <laughs> so it become cutthroat then, isn't it? And have you seen the number of brown envelopes that went between us and the trade union? It was unbelievable. Yeah. And seriously, in a car industry of that, to get- 500, 500 pounds of going right. Yes, yeah. to get ahead of, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this, this is one example of a CIP I did in about 2010-2011 uh, and we saved £245,000 annually uh, by taking a number of inspectors out, by doing MTM, UAS analysis and looking at wharf pass and all the usual stuff you do with all the main tools. And they were e never ending because 5% target of, of hundreds of people is still the number of processes you've got to you know, get rid of. Uh, so we say we use PV walls all the time, we still use them to this day, that's, that's the normal. Uh, Cross-functional teams in the CIPs, uh, but all about headcount reduction, conflict in, in all the areas. And it was all driven by base engineering content, because as we saw yesterday with Chris's um, uh, talk, uh, John and I, Zed, looked at, I think it was number 42, which was ring up and get the job done. And that's, that, was the, that was the only value added piece of work in that whole thing. Something's broke, I need somebody to fix it, come and fix it. It didn't need purchasing and buying and all the other steps in the dance, as I always say, to get the job done. Uh, so we only paid for value added work. Um, and that, in, in all essence, in, in ours, we had the green zone, so an operator, would, would that was his green zone, 180 degrees, that was his work environment. So we had to deliver all the material as close to the point of use as humanly possible, traveling the least amount of distance, because that's all cost as well, obviously, uh, logistics. So that was, that was the way our mindset always worked all the time. So at one point, we had uh, an ILO, Increased International Labour Organization. So we used to, which the time the jobs, then set them at 95%, so there's a little bit of slack in there because of human beings at the end of the day. Nobody can work flat out all the time, especially not at three o'clock in the morning. Um, so they had a bright idea in Europe, if we push it up to 100% across all the plants in Europe, we could save 500 heads. So we tried that and it fell flat on its backside within a matter of days. And there's a huge amount of work went into get to that, in line balancing and moving everything around. And we had to put it all back very quickly because we just completely lost the plot. Um, so. Okay, I'm talking ahead. So, John? Picking up, and Roddy said, I was a launch manager for one of the Astras, and uh, as you do in your headcount, as you do, you get your base engineering content, because uh, that's dictate just the value added. So, the customer won't pay for picking the screw, the customer won't pay for the movement, he'll pay for the screw revolutions, it's likely not. So, they would give you in Europe for base engineering content. That would simulate a required headcount. Uh, I had a, a German system plant director, do you remember? Um, and during launch, I was cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting the heads. I knew it wasn't going to work. I knew it wasn't going to work. And I just said to him, it's overloaded. It will not run. 
And I think I had to put, within the first three weeks, 39 heads in. And his answer was, well, we played the game and we lost. And that was his attitude. And, and you have to understand, these, the cost-driven targets, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Quality, don't even think about it. What year was it? It weren't that bad that year. Um, well, we, you know, we got successful in using the tools, but we were still a million miles away. The culture was not moving at the same speed as the tool. You know, you still got people that didn't believe in it. You, you still got people, that's crap, you know, we've done this for many years. I think Catherine said it yesterday. We've always done it. Constant trade union that you couldn't do anything about the trade union. And by this time, it wasn't too bad. We've gone from three to one trade union. So it did help a little bit. And we've got European scorecards. Has anybody dealt with you getting measured against a different plant on a European scorecard? The problem with that is, is you know, if this is just a simulated one, so there's say five or six plants across Europe, FAIs, lost workday cases, absent. But the cost one was always an interesting one because they put you against the sister plant. Our sister plant was Glavissa in Poland, yeah? But the labor rates there were so much cheaper, but it doesn't matter, the same targets were set. So you couldn't win, you were always on a loser. Uh, cost per car, hours per car, what was the profit margin, you know, harbor hours, we've all heard of harbor hours, the way it's measured, JD power, quality, it felt like, you know, at some stage, <laughs> no it did, it felt at one stage, that, you know, we're, there was always a carrot to get to the next stage. Now, this, this become quite serious in our plant closures. All through my career, and probably the same, every time a new model come, you think, Pretty well told, you're gonna close. You're gonna close. These are the plants that shut. These are the plants that went. This plant here, Antwerp, back in before probably late 90s, Roddy and I took every team member to Antwerp. That was a jewel in the Nile. They take you show the Andon systems, the 5S, the yard was free, the repair float was empty, it shut. Luton. We got three weeks notice, just looping down a field for loop, and I'll show you all the work. There's an IBC site at loop, but there was also a, a car plant at loop as well. We went to loop, we were given four weeks, they were going to build this new factory, put all the equipment in, or some of it. We were told to go down and take it and bring it up with shutting it. And we had a, and I mean, that car never went together. Did it? Have you ever, anybody got a vector? Thank God. <laughs> um, and then, if you go to this plant, Bockham, um, Huge plants, massive plants, floors and floors and floors and floors shut. And that one there at the moment is still mothballed in the same piece of paper. It's, it's not shut, it's mothballed. And PSA, as we'll talk a little bit, are looking to bring it back. Then we had the Magna threat. Everybody knows Magna, massive company. We knew GM wanted us off rid. He wanted rid of Opal Vauxhall. So they were in talks with Magna, Magna come do due diligence. We knew. If Magna took over, Ellsman Port was finished. It was, it was finished, and it got up to the 10th minute when Mary Barra, at the time, decided, no, I don't want Magna of my technology, and it just clicked, we're staying. But we, if you look there, that's twice we were closing. So where was the needle at the end of the 2000s? Well, you know, we'd come up a bit. We were still nowhere near the competition, but we got past the 50% mark, and we've started to do stuff right, but it still wasn't right. So, just a summary of the of the of 41 years. Uh, Quick 70s on. was all about poor culture, massive conflict. T Rex. Uh, the 80s yeah. was all about alteration, but right. the yeah, same right. culture. <laughs> um, the 90s was cost reduction driven, CIPs, all the tools brought in, some some part of the education, but still, you know. Uh, QNIPS was brought in uh, on the back of Newby, uh, as we got to Newby. People training started in earnest, so was, the, the cultural change started in, in, in the sort of mid 90s. Uh, okay, so there was an improvement in the culture uh, in the 90s without a shadow of a doubt. Slow, but sure. And in the 2000s, we were scorecard driven, so everything to do with lead was all about reducing cost, reducing waste, but most of that waste was in the headcount, unfortunately. Uh, the introduction of business plan deployment, uh, which I think is a great tool and it work, works well for us. Uh, centralized targets, uh, use, the use of base engineering content to drive everything, uh, and the turnaround team, where all these senior execs come in from all over the world and, and all over our plant to, to, to make us a better team. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, 
in the 2000s, there was a lot more collaboration. The relationship with trade unions improved so, so much. They understood us, we understood them a lot better, and, and that was the case then. So, so on this one, it's interesting. We've got any finance people in the room? Oh, yeah, the Fiona. Fiona. Oh, Fiona. Oh. <laughs> okay, so obviously, the big thing at the end was what was the profit and loss of Opal Vauxhall? We haven't got Vauxhall on its own. Um, what do you notice about that graph? Well, unfortunately, it hasn't, well, there's nothing on the graph, but also if you notice on the scale on this side, it hasn't got, there's nothing above zero. Because, and I'll quickly go through this, these were the losses over the years. This is for the Europe, for the whole of Europe. And that gives you where we were, and um, over 16 years, there was just over 20 billion pound, billion euro, sorry, euro losses. So you think, well, why keep it? So, the change of open. So, just X. Two, three, four. <laughs> so, okay, so we, we, went, we, we went through all that, all that change over, over many years, but we still lost money. That was the big problem. Don't know how we survived, but we, we think it was a tax bill with GM, to be fair. Like, but, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. so anyway, Cut that the video. Right. Yeah, GM was sold uh, uh, to PSA in July 2017 for a steal of two, two billion, just over two billion dollars. Uh, so obviously we have huge concerns because, again, you know, are, is the gun against the head again? Uh, are we, are we going to close down? Uh, and we felt it was like the shark was eating a smaller fish because PSA, the global company, are they just going to asset strip us, shut us down and move production elsewhere? Uh, so uh, the profit and losses in previous years, that worked against us clearly because we knew that because everything was, was reported out. Would our brand survive? Would we survive as a company in the UK? Uh, and what else would we cause? You know, what, would we make the cost? Uh, and obviously capacity in PSA plants, we know, is greater than demand. They've got lots of capacity and they've got lots of plants all over the place. Uh, would vehicle platforms be combined, as I was saying? Uh, and when, when, we, when they first joined us, their initial cost directive was quite ruthless, even worse than GM's was. You know, they were completely ruthless. Straightforward, you know, you've got to take this out, you've got to save that, you've got to move that piece of equipment over there for no money, or as little money as possible. But what they did do, um, there was a culture change with PSA because they gave the plants autonomy. Because when I was, when I would put a business case together to do to do a bit, when I one of the jobs I was as a planning manager in logistics, I wanted to move a big part of my logistics stores to another building. How much it going to cost? How long would it take? Yeah, just do it. And that's what PSA were like. General Motors, you had to go to different departments in Europe, in America. You couldn't get anything done. It's a nightmare. So change was very, very slow in GM. If you wanted, if you had good ideas uh, and you wanted to do something, it was difficult to do. They got in your way, General Motors. It didn't help you. But PSA were brilliant. They gave the plan. They said it's 